On July 23, 2001, a political science graduate student at Yale University named Jason Sorens published a radical essay introducing the Free State Project, a proposal to see what kind of political change could take hold if 20,000 pro-liberty activists moved to a low population state and worked toward the creation of a truly free society. He'd been studying historical independence and secession movements around the world when the idea for the Free State Project came to him. I put it up online, 200 people emailed me expressing interest. We recruited our first 5,000 members by 2003, and at that point we chose our destination state. The idea caught on, and on February 3rd, 2016, the Free State Project finally reached its goal of 20,000 signers, each of them pledging to relocate to New Hampshire within five years, though close to 2,000 early movers are already here, making a tremendous impact in their communities and in the state legislature. When I first thought of the idea of the Free State Project, I had no idea what kind of success we could have. Uh, but today, we're having immense success building freedom here in New Hampshire. To celebrate the 15-year anniversary of Dr. Soren's original essay, we traveled up to interview him at Dartmouth College, where he teaches in the government department. We wanted to capture his reflections on the first 15 years of this decentralized movement, as well as his predictions for its future. We also discussed the benefits of minimal government, why he's so passionate about sharing libertarian ideals, and whether New Hampshire might be poised to peacefully declare its independence from the United States within the next decade. Jason, it's been 15 years since you wrote the essay that started the Free State Project. What does this mean for you? It's been amazing to see what's happened to the Free State Project idea since then uh, and to finally be living it. Now it's to the next phase, right? We, we've you got uh, 20,000 people who've signed up just, yeah, we got just 20, this February. That's right. And how many are here now? A little over, or around 2,000 Around 2,000. And then plus native supporters of the Free State Project, we have almost 3,000 of those. So we have close to 5,000 Free Staters of some kind here in New Hampshire. More people are going to be coming, thousands more moving over the next five years. So now the, the strategy shifts toward getting those people to move and making more liberty here in New Hampshire. So this is really where the rubber meets the road finally, uh, where we start creating a free society. What did it feel like to actually get that 20,000th signer? I mean, fif almost 15 years later, um, what was that leading up to it and what did it feel like that day when the move was finally triggered? Well, it felt like a, a moment to pause and appreciate what all of us who'd been working on this had accomplished. It felt good to hit the 20,000 in the way we did. We hit it with a lot of momentum. We had 2,500 signatures in the last four months up to when we triggered the move, and we're continuing uh, to get signers, and we've kind of found a way to get signers pretty cheaply using uh, social media advertising. So it feels like a moment to be optimistic because we have all these people who are interested in the Free State Project who are planning to move and yeah we know that not all 20,000 of the original signers will actually move but if we get 40,000 signers I bet we can get 20,000 movers over the next five years. Well take me back to when you were actually writing this essay I mean what what led up to you writing it and what was the what was the impetus and what, what, how did the idea come to you? Yeah, I'd been a libertarian activist in college, and in 2001 I was in graduate school and just starting my dissertation research. Uh, I was disappointed at the lack of progress libertarians had made on the national political scene. Um, George Bush had just been elected president. It was before 9-11, but even so, it was obvious that he was no libertarian and that this uh, wave of uh, optimism that libertarians had had in the mid uh, to late 90s about how globalization and the internet were going to tear down the state and liberate individuals. That wave of optimism was definitely receding. We had the dot-com uh, bubble bursting and it was clear the governments weren't giving up uh, much power. And since then things have just gotten worse. So the idea at the time was we need, to, we need to leverage our activists. We need to do something here to, uh, to increase the power of libertarian ideas. We're never going to take over DC. We're never going to have, sad as it is to say, we're never gonna have a libertarian president and libertarian Congress. It's just not gonna happen, at least not without starting somewhere and, and building a base for these ideas. So we needed a territorial base. Uh, to start libertarian ideas. Uh, my dissertation was on secessionist movements in 
high-income democracies, Western Europe, North America, I started to think about the fact that the state level in the U.S. is really important. We're still a federation. States can get more autonomy from the federal government if they push hard enough. And we can get more freedom in areas like criminal justice, education, business regulation, taxation. These are all areas that states control. We can create a, a libertarian state that would be both a model to the rest of the world and also be a, a competitive lever to pry open uh, the rest of the country by attracting investment to, to New Hampshire, attracting productive workers to New Hampshire. And we've definitely seen a lot of entrepreneurs move their, their businesses to New Hampshire. Uh, a lot of activists come here. What are some of the sort of highlights, some of the most important things that you've seen transpire over this course since free, the Free State Project was started? First, I should mention that New Hampshire wasn't something I decided on personally. It was the choice of Free Staters. Uh, shortly after the Free State Project chose New Hampshire, uh, some natives formed an organization called the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance that has been very effective in the political realm. Um, if you talk to uh, representatives in the New Hampshire State House, they'll tell you that now about 80 to 100 representatives out of 400 total will vote consistently libertarian, at least 85% of the time. Those aren't all free staters. We have about 18 free state project participants who moved to New Hampshire and were elected to the state house. Right? That's, that's roughly the number. Um, but they're having influence beyond their numbers because of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance and the ability to get these ideas in the hands of people who've been here a long time, people who've run for office and gotten activated, seeing this, uh, this new liberty movement emerge. That's been a, a big success. I like to see the entrepreneurs creating jobs, starting new companies, bringing companies to the state. I think uh, Jason Osborne's company, CAI, Credit Adjustments, Inc., uh, has brought a number of jobs to New Hampshire. He's been elected as a state rep. A big impact has been uh, Keith Murphy. Uh, his uh, chain of, of Murphy's restaurants has uh, been employing dozens of New Hampshire residents. So we're coming to the state. We're creating new jobs. We're creating new wealth, more importantly. Bardo Farm is really interesting. It's a, um, a large working farm. Uh, one of the uh, Free State Project's uh, directors, Jody Underwood, is one of the owners of that farm. And um, it's been a place where um, people can come to the state, they can work on the farm, they can get food and lodging, and often they will move on. But it's a place where they can land when they first move to the state. And it's an example of, uh, of, a, of successful entrepreneurship. Um, but it's also an example of community building because they hold events reaching out to the community. Um, Jody herself is chair of the school board in Croydon which has voted to have uh, full school choice, allowing uh, parents to send their kids to any school of their choice and the um, tuition dollars will follow the child rather than having to be spent only on uh, the government school. These are all some examples of important things Free Staters have done in New Hampshire. Uh, Shire Sharing would be another one. Amanda Bolden has started a, uh, a charity that gives uh, Thanksgiving meals to families in need and last Thanksgiving gave out hundreds of meals. I don't even know the exact figure. It was over 600. Yeah, over 600 meals, uh, Thanksgiving meals to families. Families, maybe, yeah. something like that. So whether it's charity, entrepreneurship, community building, or politics and uh, defending people's rights, uh, yeah. Free State has made a difference. Let's talk a little bit about on the legislative side. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the union leader, the Concord Monitor, had pointed out that there were, with 18 uh, Free Staters on, uh, within the State House, so even though we only make up 0.5% of the population of New Hampshire, Free State Project uh, participants make up about 5% of the State House. So that's pretty significant. What legislative changes have been brought about or what legislative changes have been not brought about, have been you know, taken away because of Free State or action? Yeah, one of the most significant recent changes was that New Hampshire abolished civil asset forfeiture. That was a bill written by a Free State Project participant, Dan McGuire, and it was uh, passed by the House and Senate and signed by the governor. We still have a little more work to do there to prevent cases from being adopted by the federal government and used under laxer federal rules, but this is a major move. For those not familiar, civil asset forfeiture is the government essentially taking your property without giving you a trial, is that correct? If That's right. So the, the property is deemed guilty of a crime, even if you, the owner of the property, are not guilty. Um, 
So and this is something we've seen the federal government use a lot with local and state police, uh, seizing billions of dollars worth of goods, more than home robbery, right. uh, in fact. So this is a big issue that more states are waking up to, but it sounds like New Hampshire is again at the forefront of protecting some of this. Yes, that's right. So from now on, if the state police want to take your property, they have to convict you of a crime, period. Okay, so that's a step. It sounds like we do still have more work to do. Um, and there's certainly more work to be done, which is why the Free State Project continues to exist. It's to bring those movers who did sign and to continue to bring people who are signing up now. Other than writing the, thing, the essay that started this whole thing, I know you're still very active with education and, and teaching people about economics and libertarian ideals. Talk a little bit about that, sort yeah. of what you do. Well, my day job is related to this. I, I teach at Dartmouth and uh, run a program called the Political Economy Project, which um, is a kind of outside the classroom effort to engage students in ideas. It's not just classical liberal or libertarian, um, but those ideas also do get a hearing. Uh, in fact, tomorrow we're doing a, a dinner with uh, students on uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology. They're really interested in that. So. Uh, we're having um, a New Hampshire State Representative, uh, Keith Ammon, come and speak uh, to, the, to the students, um, who is uh, also a free stater. I started a nonprofit called Ethics and Economics Education of New England, and we do an after-school program in high schools. It's Socratic discussion. They get free books, including classics like uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, John Locke's Second Treatise of Government, Milton and Rose Friedman's Free to Choose and they compete for college scholarships uh, in a speech competition at the end of the year. Uh, that's been a very successful program. The parents love it, the teachers love it, the students love it, and it's getting uh, libertarian ideas out there. We also do conferences for policymakers uh, in Concord, and uh, we bring in experts to talk about a state and local issue, inform them of the free market perspective on this issue, which is usually just sort of the mainstream perspective in economics. Could you talk a little bit about these libertarian ideals and why you're so passionate about them and why you want to educate so many people about them? Yeah. Libertarianism is just about respecting the equal rights of everybody. Right? So you the have... individual. Yeah, every, every person. You have a right to do whatever you want so long as you're not taking away someone else's rights you know, to act in a similar manner. So um, even if you're harming yourself, even if you're doing something that's morally wrong, so long as you aren't taking away someone else's rights, you should be allowed to do that. You, we shouldn't send you to prison for drug use or not giving to charity or whatever. And the problem with modern government is that it violates people's rights all the time. It's inconsistent with equal rights. Right? The government can take your property and distribute it for causes that it believes are good, but you, you can't do that, and I can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to go around taxing people for our favorite causes. Government can do that. But why? Is there anything that, that justifies government's ability to, to tax or to kidnap people for uh, possessing substances um, or murder people in the name of war, right? A lot of people seem to believe that government has special rights that no one else has. Libertarians deny that. We think we all have the same rights. Now, some people think, well, you've consented to the government. There's some sort of social contract. But in actual fact, none of us have ever actually signed a contract. We've never actually consented in any, um, in any way that any court of law would recognize. So government just has, it does, doesn't have authority to tell us what to do in our private lives. So libertarianism is about um, letting people dispose of their property and their lives and their liberty as they see fit without interference, coerc coercion from other people. So one of the more interesting things I heard this in this election cycle is just that so many people who are you know maybe supporting who were supporting Bernie Sanders, they want some of the same things that libertarians want more you know some of the things that were promised to people who followed Bernie, but you know those would still be under the threat of coercion or under coercion. So can, if you can talk a little bit just about how we want a lot of the same things that socialists might want, we just have a very different view of how to get at them. I think that's true of actually everyone from socialists to conservatives, uh, that they may want some of the th same things that we want, they just want to use illegitimate means to those ends. Um, now, we do have a lot of common ground with Bernie supporters on foreign policy, and we're going to stop a lot of the wars. Uh, on things like drug policy. We think marijuana should be legal. But the problem comes in, in economics. So you want a fairer society, you want um, maybe a more equal 
economically equal society, those things are great. But um, can you use force of government to take from one person to give to another? Um, that's illegitimate, right? That's that's stealing. Uh, you know, you don't have a right to do that uh, through the government any more than you have the right to do that as an individual, break into rich people's houses and take their stuff and give it to poor people. Um, it's really the same thing. Uh, taxation fundamentally is is uh, is theft. So we welcome um, egalitarians like like Bernie supporters. We also welcome. Um, Maybe some social conservatives. They want, uh, they want a more virtuous society, but they want to enforce it by prison. But prisons and SWAT teams are not a good way to build a healthy moral culture. Um, we need to be willing to tolerate people's private lifestyle choices, even when we disagree with them. And we can show them where they go wrong. We can let them suffer the natural consequences of their bad choices, uh, right? If they... Um, abuse drugs and their their life is going to be bad. They don't need to be thrown in, in prison to, to teach them that. If you're an egalitarian or a social conservative, give up your use of force. Uh, use, use force and self-defense only and uh, and become a libertarian. And, uh, and we, we might have a lot in common. Well, it's something I discovered when I was about 13. I was supposed to do a school report on a political party and everyone in my class did Democrat or Republican. And I had called around all the different parties and got information from all of them. And that's when I got tipped off to uh, libertarianism. It's something I followed. But it's not something I was surrounded by, by any means. Um, in Los Angeles, I, there weren't very many friends I talked politics with at all. It's been very refreshing for me to be surrounded by other people who feel similarly to, uh, to myself. And I wanted to know a little bit about your experience with that. Since you've moved, what has it been like to be around so many like-minded individuals? Yeah, the, the world's largest libertarian community is in New Hampshire. And that's a very different kind of feeling when for a get-together on any given day in any part of the state, you know, there'll be 40 to 50 libertarians hanging out, um, which you probably couldn't get together in New York City for, a, a, you know, a major event. <laughs> that's, uh, that's been really energizing because it is a big community and... Um, you can find people within that community that you really get along with and that you can work with on whatever projects interest you. The Free State Project makes your strategy more effective, whatever it is. If it's education, legislation, running for office, um, entrepreneurship, uh, community um, building, community economics, all those things are much more effective when you have lots of like-minded people around you that you can recruit from and, and work with. It's also been great on a personal level. I mean, we have a five-year-old daughter and she has lots of friends now in this state. You know, it's just great to have um, lots of friends around that uh, you can trust to respect your rights and freedoms just as you respect theirs. Um, that's not to say that free staters only hang out with other free staters, right? Um, I, I think this project only works if we're engaged in our communities and not just insular and looking inward. Um, but it's great to have that kind of reservoir that you can fall back on for support. When you brought it up earlier as well that New Hampshire has a big independence movement already. We are, we are amplifying it, but there's a lot of people already here who believe in this similar ideas that the government really has no business in their personal lives. And so I think that's where we see a lot of the echo, too, is just that um, a lot of these events that we go out to, we get a good amount of support from, from locals and from pre-staters, people who lived here before New Hampshire was chosen for the Free State Project. Well, and how about your, your first day here, when you guys first arrived? Yeah. You, tell us about that. Well, when we first arrived with our moving truck, uh, we were moving into an apartment, and uh, 60 people showed up to help us unload the truck. I mean, it was... 60. <laughs> 60. Six zero. And so in practice, what that meant was that uh, about half of them were setting up a party, <laughs> and half of them unloaded the truck. It was unloaded in about 20 minutes. There's a guy there making balloon animals, and all this food was there, and it was getting cooked, and and everybody had a good time, and uh, it turned into to one big party. So... I'm not saying every move-in party is like that in New Hampshire, but uh, if you move here, yes, you will get help moving in, and, uh, and that can be a godsend after uh, driving for several hours across the country. Yeah, I was going to say 60 sounds like a lot, but these welcome wagons, they happen for people who move here. They just post your information, and people help you unload your truck within an hour a lot of times is what I hear. You mentioned your daughter. Um, 
how has that been? I've, I've definitely met a lot of great families here who practice non-aggression principle and peaceful parenting and these ideas that I've never um, begun to encounter before and I can notice the difference, but um, what do you think is here for the next generation that comes around? Yeah, I mean, um, you, you'll get different parenting styles that I think are a little more, um, you know, a little more maybe progressive or, or tolerant. Um, you also get more homeschooling and private schooling than you would have in the general population. And so you have, um, you know, these big networks of homeschoolers, especially in the population centers. Uh, one of the activist centers in Portsmouth, the Praxium, now hosts a lot of different uh, homeschool co-ops where um, kids will come in and a teacher will come in who has expertise in a particular specialized area and will we'll teach them. You're not going to find those sorts of opportunities in many other places, certainly not in a place that doesn't have big cities. Right? And that's the other thing about New Hampshire is that it's small cities, suburbs, and rural areas. So if you like to sort of get away from it all, have the kind of all-American experience of a small town, and yet still have these big networks of friends and, and homeschoolers and like-minded, politically like-minded people, you're only going to find that in New Hampshire. What major obstacles do you see that we could really benefit from having more people here? I do a, a study called Freedom in the 50 States. Um, it's coming out shortly uh, from the Cato Institute. And that's been eye-opening to see where New Hampshire does well and New Hampshire does badly. New Hampshire always does very well in this study, but there are some areas where New Hampshire could improve. A lot of movers to the state notice that cost of living tends to be high in the areas with lots of jobs. And that's because of zoning regulations uh, that inhibit new building of houses. So this is an area where we could um, get New Hampshire to do a lot better. There are, of course, places you can go in New Hampshire where there are virtually no property taxes and no zoning. Um, but they're going to be far from jobs. To open up economic opportunity to more people, we need to uh, get rid of some of these regulations. Um, I'd like to see New Hampshire get more autonomy from the federal government. And this is the, the big concern right now is that whether it's Obamacare or the drug war or whatever, the federal or government... The, or the war wars, <laughs> all, yeah, all of them. That's right. The federal government is um, taking away Americans' freedoms. Here in New Hampshire, we have an opportunity to defend people's rights. Um, we can do that by getting more powers back from the federal government. Let's have our own health care system. Let's have our own labor market system. Let's have our own control over taxation and, and not send all this money to D.C. where... 30% uh, of what New Hampshire men send to D.C. is taken away. It's not spent in this state. Uh, it's spent el elsewhere. We need to get more autonomy from the federal government. The Free State Project is the only effort going that offers a reasonable prospect of doing that anywhere in the country because we're bringing people interested in liberty, interested in protecting people's rights to New Hampshire um, where this is already a, an active issue, you know, we, we can make a difference. We can take this message to the people, and I think they'll, they'll like it. I mean, they'll get a 30% tax cut uh, if New Hampshire just paid its own way. And, you know, we got rid of all these, these federal taxes and just let New Hampshire fund its own programs. Yeah, we'd still have a common market with the rest of the country. We would trade freely, free migration, free investment with the rest of the country. There's no reason why... Our economic and criminal justice policies can't be determined solely at home. You, you've written about secessionism in your, yeah. in, your, in your book here, Secessionism by Jason Sorens. We have this unique situation where we have uh, Carla Garrick, who was formerly the president of the Free State Project, is now uh, leading the, New Ham the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence, as well as running for Senate. Um, and then we've got another group that started up recently by Dave Ridley, NHExit.com. So we've got these sort of two independence movements. Historically, where have we seen secessions sprout up? What are the sort of things that lead to people demanding more autonomy from a larger uh, tyrannical government or just more encroaching government? And are we seeing these signs pop up here with the federal government in the United States? Typically, you need a territory with its own cultural identity to have a secession movement. That's a necessary but not a sufficient condition. In addition to having your own cultural identity, there need to be some benefits from being independent. New Hampshire is a case where there are definitely some obvious benefits to independence. New Hampshire could keep 30% of its tax revenue to either spend at home or cut taxes at home. 
it's discriminated against by the rest of the country. New Hampshire could benefit from independence, it could trade freely, it's got an international port, it's got a border with Canada, but New Hampshire doesn't yet have the kind of cultural identity that we normally see with secession movements. Um, look at Canada. You have a strong secession movement in Quebec and a very, very weak one in Alberta. Alberta is a case where the, uh, the province could have immense economic benefits from independence. But they don't really have, they don't speak their own language, they don't have a history of independence, they don't really have that cultural background. Quebec would lose from independence. It, it's uh, poorer than the rest of Canada, it receives net payments from the federal government there, yet it has a very strong cultural background um, based principally around language, um, and so they have a secession movement. Um, so to get a strong secession movement in New Hampshire, uh, and I'm I'm just speaking here not as if New Hampshire ought to have a secession movement or New Hampshire ought to secede. That's up to each viewer to decide for himself. But the necessary condition here for New Hampshire to have a strong movement is to have a strong cultural identity. And so that cultural identity might come from um, ideology. It might come from a kind of distinctively libertarian or classical liberal identity, that this is what we think the role of government is. It's going to take some years to build that identity, but it's not impossible. Thinking about the future, 20 or 30 years from now, maybe New Hampshire will be independent. Um, you know, every, uh, every empire falls and the United States will not be intact forever. We just have to, um, you know, we have to be ready for the opportunities. I think if we look at the current election, that might create more demand for independence. The fact that Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton is going to be the next president, almost certainly. Uh, and I, I kind of agree with PGR work myself. I see Hillary Clinton as very bad, but a kind of normal sort of bad. And I see Trump as possibly the final blow to the republic. Now, if, if Trump were elected, I personally would favor New Hampshire becoming independent you know, as soon as possible, because I don't want to see my friends get sent to camps. I mean, <laughs> you know, these are the types of things that probably won't happen if Trump's elected, but might happen. And that's, that's scary. I mean, yes, yeah, so there might be an opportunity in the, in the next couple of years to push for independence from a, a federal government that has gone completely crazy. Yeah, and you, you talked a second ago about blockchain and Bitcoin, and you, in a previous video we shot with you, you actually said something about a global trend towards decentralization. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So we do see a trend uh, worldwide, rich countries, poor countries, democracies um, especially, uh, moving toward more local government. Um, so they let local governments uh, spend more, um, tax more, just have more autonomy to do their own thing. Um, it's an interesting trend. The U.S. has gone the opposite direction. At least since the 1930s, uh, the federal government said doing more and more and states less and less. But that might turn around if these international trends um, are any, uh, any indication. So if you look at Great Britain, gave autonomy to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland in the last few years. Um, Spain gave autonomy to its autonomous communities. Uh, Italy gave lots more powers to their regions. Belgium became, moved from a unitary state to a federal state. So we see all these examples of moving towards more decentralization. Um, and I think there are political reasons for that. But it might also be that there are technological reasons for that. It might just be that this country is so big, um, people feel disempowered. They feel like they don't have control over their representatives in D.C. More local government just makes sense, given the the complexity of our economy, the level of population we have. What are the prospects that 536 people in D.C., right, House, Senate, and President, are going to be able to run the American economy? They can't, not even close. Um, but if we have, you know, more policies done at the local level where uh, local circumstances can affect the types of policies we have, then that might make more sense. Um, I mean, New Hampshire has 1.3 million people. That was... Uh, you know, that would have been uh, enough to make New Hampshire, I believe, uh, the largest state in, in 1789. Um, this is not a, a too small an economy to be autonomous. It's not, too, you know, we're not too small to have our own policies. Well, and there's a, there's a precedent. New Hampshire was the first to declare its independence from Great Britain so many years ago. And it's written into the New Hampshire Constitution, which predates the U.S. Constitution, that we, you know, maintain a, a right to secede. 
So on secession, we just celebrated July 4th, which has sort of been overtaken and made not about secession, but that's exactly what it was. It was the United States breaking away from Great Britain. What do you see happening now that could lead for a call for secession from the federal government? Um, we're seeing these Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter protests. We're seeing uh, robot drones being sent in to bomb people in Dallas shootings. These are new precedents that are being set without trials. Uh, huge militarization of police force, huge police misconduct cases. Do you see any of this leading to some kind of revolt? I mean, it is somewhat, but is this something that could lead to calls for secession? Yeah. Yeah, the police brutality issue is one where libertarians have uh, something important to say. Um, some of this probably is about race, for sure. Um, but some of it is also simply about government power. Those with overwhelming coercive force uh, are under an especial responsibility to use that force responsibly. Too often we're seeing police not being trained to de-escalate um, situations, but to escalate them. I think these problems tend to be bigger in bigger cities and bigger states. Um, this is not to say that New Hampshire is perfect. Uh, we have some cases of police overreach where there's an active movement pushing back against them. But I, I would say those problems are not as bad here as they are elsewhere. Um, here in New Hampshire, um, most people live in smaller towns where they have full control over their budgets. They can control the police budget. They know the um, police personally. And so police have an incentive um, to be tied into their local communities. Um, this, is a, this is a real subtle advantage that, of New Hampshire that a lot of people don't, get, don't really get. The they've, fact. they've got Bearcats, though. I mean, got, we, we had the lockdown in Manchester yeah. not too long ago where the police had yeah. uh, allegedly caught their suspect but still p had people in like a lockdown for hours. So there's still work to be done, but that's something, yeah. again, we showed up at City Hall. There was a group of 50-plus people that spoke up about how unjust that was and how fourth, where's our Fourth Amendment, you know? Yeah. So, um, but we need more of that. We need more pushback. On secession, Brexit. What, what's, what's your take on Brexit and what do you see a domino effect possibly happening? Or, I mean, this isn't just going to go away in the media. This is going, there's going to be a transition and... Yeah. In my opinion, Brexit was a bad idea, actually. I think okay. the um, European Union is, has been more liberalizing than controlling. Um, yes, there are some EU regulations, but most of those simply replicate national level regulations or standardize them. Uh, it doesn't look as if Britain's going to be just getting rid of these regulations. They're going to have national regulations, but just as much regulation. Furthermore, the EU allowed free movement of people, investment, and goods across borders. Uh, this was really important. It allowed uh, a country like Ireland to slash its uh, taxation and its regulatory burden, and investment flowed to Ireland, and they were able to export to the European continent. That allowed Ireland to achieve monumental growth rates in the 80s and 90s. It passed Great Britain in per capita income. Yes, it was hit hard by the financial crisis, but it's also rebounded strongly, and it's again ahead of Great Britain in per capita income. Uh, so the EU allowed for governments to compete with each other. I think Britain withdrawing from the EU is mostly about stopping immigration. That doesn't sound like a freedom-friendly thing to me. Um, now, it's good that the EU allows member states to leave. That's very important. Member states can u leave unilaterally and they can renegotiate their relationship. That's great. Um, so Brexit uh, is at least a peaceful model of withdrawal from a federation. And, and that's something that should be followed more often. Uh, I, th I would also point to when Scotland was able to vote on independence in 2014. That's a great example where the British government actually said to a part of the country, you know, if you don't want to be a part of this country, we're not going to force you. And we want, we want you to be a part of this country voluntarily. The U.S. government should take the same attitude. If a state wants to secede, it should be allowed to go its own way. Uh, it shouldn't be held in by force. Uh, that's what criminal gangs do. That's not, um, that's not what democracy should be about. The closer you look at government, the more depressing it can be. Are you optimistic about the future? I tend to be pessimistic about politics, but optimistic about society. Uh, when you look at the long sweep of things, the human species has been getting less violent over time. We've been um, allowing more equal rights over time to different types of people. Um, we're becoming more tolerant of 
people's private beliefs and lifestyles. Uh, I think that's going to continue. The U.S. government is clearly dysfunctional, so something's going to have to give. I mean, it's just getting worse and worse. The next four years are going to be pretty bad for the U.S. government, uh, and that's a real opportunity because society keeps changing, government keeps getting worse. It's an opportunity for, our, for a fundamental break to happen, and there's no better place to start it than New Hampshire. Uh, that, that last point you made about um, that, that people are becoming much more tolerant of each other and crime is down, all these data points are out there, but it doesn't seem to be the message that the media is delivering. It seems to be just be more infighting, more divisive narratives, and I welcome anyone to look at the numbers that are actually out there, that the statistics, the crime statistics are down globally. Yeah. Economics, people are rising up out of deep poverty yeah. globally. There's a lot happening. Yeah, the global poverty rate has halved over the last 30 years. That's an immense achievement. Uh, I mean, the human species for millennia lived in desperate poverty. And now, for the first time, the majority of humans have broken out of that. You know, new technology does make us, makes us better off, but it also makes us freer because we're creating these new spaces that aren't regulated yet. And if we can keep creating these new technologies, these new ways of associating together that have value, um, ahead of, the, you know, this slow, sluggish, um, clunking government, then freedom will just continue to expand. So that's, that is the future of the Free State Project. I mean, we have all the movers who are coming here and doing their own things. And like you said, there's all these different avenues, education, in, in the system activism, out of the system activism, or just simply moving here and prospecting libertarian ideals. That's activism in and of itself. But there's a lot of opportunities. The Free State Project as, a, as an entity is helping movers get information they need and encouraging them to come sooner than later. Um, what else do you see for the future, both of the organization and of some of the movers that are here and are to come? Yeah, I mean, I, I see the organization, the Free State Project organization, being about getting 20,000 movers here. And then once we do that, the Free State Project organization will go away. That's my personal view of what, what will happen. All these al alternative organizations have already sprouted up. They're just going to get bigger, right? The New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, uh, Shire Sharing, all the, the regional activist centers. Um, that's where you can plug in and make a difference, even if you don't live in New Hampshire yet you can support some of these organizations, whether it's reviewing bills for the NHLA or giving money to Shire Sharing or to Ethics and Economics Education. That's what's going to build um, greater public support for freedom here. I mean, that's ultimately what it's all about. We're, uh, you know, 20,000 people. We're not going to outvote everyone here. That's not the idea. The idea is to show that these ideas of freedom work. And we can do that. Libertarian ideas will be are, are popular if you can uh, express them and present them to people in a way that they understand that they can take the time uh, to, to really think about. And as we try these ideas, as, as new laws get enacted and we get more, uh, more liberty, more of these liberty bills pass, um, that's just going to show people that these policies work. And that's going to have an influence on New Hampshire, it's going to have an influence on the rest of the world. So it's really historic what we're doing here. And, uh, if you if you want to see what a free society looks like, you owe it to yourself to be a part of it. It's an uncertain but exciting time in human evolution. The Free State Project is now the most successful intentional migration movement in American history, and it continues to grow, with new movers arriving week after week. If you would like to move or come visit New Hampshire to see the impact we're having for yourself, just email info at freestateproject.org with your travel dates, and you'll get connected with movers who'd be glad to meet you and show you around. To learn more about the Free State Project and to see what FSP movers are building in their communities, check out more of our videos and features at fspmovers.com.